We are nearing the final stretch. <laughs> um, we're also nearing the next exam. So today's lecture is going to uh, kind of conclude our section um, for exam two. So tests that you're responsible for are uh, regressions and correlations, t-tests, and one-way ANOVAs, okay? Some terminology from previous uh, exam one content obviously will cross over, so types of data, um, identification of independent and dependent variables, uh, kind of having a knowledge of the normal curve or normal distribution. You don't have to know the specifics on, you know, like what percentage exists at certain numbers or values or anything. Um, but you should understand how to evaluate normality. Uh, there may or may not be a question on normality. Sometimes I include one. Um, I think two out of three semesters I've still included a question on normality on exam two. But um, I, again, strongly suggest using the flowcharts. That's one advantage you guys have over uh, all of the other semesters I've taught is that you can use your flowcharts at home uh, when you're actually taking the exam. Previous semesters, they didn't get to use those uh, during class. So um, understand how they work, and I think you should be OK. Um, I did want to mention I emailed Ooh, I think it was on Friday. I emailed the class and um, I think it's really cool. The school is doing mid-semester progress reports so that you guys kind of know how you're doing in the class. So far, everyone's doing exceptionally well. Um, I don't know how that will change after exam two. Generally, exam two is usually the hardest of the three uh, exams. So I would just say like, keep up on your studying, take an hour out of your day to, or like hour out of every day to just review things or like pick one thing that you wanna focus on that way you're not too overwhelmed. Cause I know there's a lot of information that comes with this exam. Um, and I think one area where people usually get mixed up is not having their null hypotheses sorted out. So as long as you know the null, where to look for the p-value to evaluate that null for a given test or assumption test, you should be okay. Um, so with that being said, let's flow in. Our lecture today isn't actually that complicated in terms of terminology you've seen before, but also uh, conceptually in our decision tree, we're kind of just tagging on to t-tests, so ANOVAs are just more complex t-tests. But before we do that, I love to smile and laugh, so here are my memes of the week. Rappers today be looking like a desk in detention. I just, I don't know, I laughed, I think I laughed more um, than I should have when I found this on Instagram. Um, this one might be slightly inappropriate, but I think we're all mature adults. Cowboys don't roll joints. They tumble weed. Ha ha. And then my last one, I thought it was kind of applicable um, or relatable uh, based on the part of the semester that we're in. It's a video. <laughs> what? Anyways, um, I feel like this baby is a mood altogether, <laughs> but um, yep, so with that being said, let's look at ANOVAs now that we're crying inside. Um, so first things first, let's look at our decision tree. As you can see, paired t-tests, independent t-tests, along with single sample t-tests, which aren't on the decision tree. Um, correlation regression, we've done all of these, okay? So 
If you recall, the main factor that distinguishes correlations and regressions um, from any other test that we have, at, at least that we cover in this class, is that it has both parametric independent and dependent variables, right? But in a t-test, we had a parametric dependent variable or some quantifiable data that we've measured and got values for. And then our independent variable categorized our sample in some way, right? So in a t-test specifically, we only had two categorizations or two groupings, two levels of that single independent variable. And then we decided to run whatever tests based on who was in our sample. If we had a single sample compared with an estimated population um, mean, then we would use a single sample t-test. If we had between subjects or independent samples, we use an independent t-test. And then if we use the same people or within subject design for all of our groupings, then we used a paired t-test. A very similar crossover goes into ANOVAs in the sense that instead of two groupings or two levels, we have three or more. So instead of having like a pretest, post test, maybe we have pretest or baseline measurement, and then um, take this class for example, right? Like, uh, well, maybe that's a bad, bad thought. I was going to say your grade could then you could look at it at different points in the semester, but. Um, Let's go back to pretest, post test, because I, I don't like that, what I just came up with. Um, but you have pretest, post test on some type of intervention, right? So let's say it's a 12 week intervention and you add a six week benchmark to evaluate how does this person, you know, what is their rate of improvement up to six weeks and does that level off somewhere um, by the time they get to their 12 week marker, right? Um, so again, instead of two values, Whoops, we're adding three, okay? Um, let me go back to that slide real quick, uh, because then we can look at different types of ANOVAs based on how we collect our samples, right? So if we have three individual samples where each person in each sample is completely different people, right, or between subject design, we would run a simple one-way ANOVA. Um, we also, could uh, call this an independent samples ANOVA, or just a lot commonly, or, or commonly it is referred to as just a one-way ANOVA, okay? If we use the same subjects for each of our groupings, let's say we have three, right? And in which case the intervention or pretest, post-test example that I just uh, presented, where maybe we take baseline measurements and then six week and then 12 week, we're tracking the same person in each of those groups, right? So that would be a within subject design, in which case we call that a repeated measures ANOVA or repeated measures one way ANOVA, okay? Today specifically, we're talking about one way ANOVAs. So um, whenever you label or, or just kind of get in the habit of, instead of saying, I'm doing an ANOVA, you have to specify one way ANOVA. Okay, the only reason I didn't put it in here is because it didn't fit in the circles. So there's a lot going on. <laughs> but um, just be specific. The one indicates how many independent variables you have. So since we only have one independent variable, we're looking at a one way interaction between groupings. Okay, once we get over into factorial ANOVAs, these are also commonly referred to as two way ANOVAs, and you can see on this uh, part of our decision tree, we branch off where we have two or more independent variables. But that'll come in a couple of weeks. Okay, so one, ways, one way ANOVAs are um, specifically what we're looking at today. Okay, so I kind of just wanted to go through some basics because the general concept between um, a, a simple one way ANOVA and a repeated measures one way ANOVA are very, very similar. The way that we calculate things is just slightly different, but the interpretation of the null hypothesis is the same. Um, generally, our assumptions are the same with the exception of one assumption for each of our um, uh, tests. Um, and then how we read a table is slightly different, but more often than not, if we're working out of SPSS, you're given an exact p-value. So working with the, the table I'll present isn't going to be as hefty 
um, on your part. But again, just written out in words, right? We're going to use an ANOVA when we're trying to compare three or more groups, okay? Um, so I don't know if you guys recall the first exam, there was a question about um, looking at the effects of uh, energy drink consumption on like a 1RM squat, right? And I said, people are drinking bang, they drink Celsius, and they'll drink, I don't remember what the other one was, uh, C4, sure, C4 is good. Um, but that would be an example of three different groups, right? We could have um, individuals, like different individuals drink only bang, only Celsius, or only C4, right? Celsius, what am I thinking of? Is Celsius one? No, I said rain, it's rain. I don't even know what I'm talking about anymore. Anyways, you have one independent group drink each of these um, energy drinks, right? Or we could have a single group drink each of the energy drinks, but on separate days, right? So again, between, within subject, totally up to the researcher. But in either case, we're comparing three or more groups, okay? Um, the goal of ANOVAs is to look at the variability between groups to see um, if any groups mean for whatever you're measuring is significantly different from another group's mean, okay? So ANOVA actually stands for Analysis of Variance. Right, so that's kind of where this aim of the test comes from. You're just assessing the variability between groups, right? And say, is the difference between the groups, which we usually look at the mean, right? Is that difference um, uh, significant enough between the groups such that um, some type of intervention or treatment causes a significant result? Right. Or we could kind of tie it back to how we referred to t-tests and say, have all the samples, all three or more samples been taken or re are they representative of the same population? Or do our results indicate that a treated group is significantly different from an untreated group? Okay. Well, that's another interpretation um, of the goal of ANOVA. Okay. Our null hypothesis is a very, very similar to a t-test, okay? So we're basically looking, is there an effect of an independent variable on a dependent variable, okay? Given that we have multiple manipulations of that independent variable, okay? Remember, null hypothesis will always say there is no effect, right? Um, and in this case, we could also say there's no significant difference between any of the means of the given samples, right? or uh, basically that the means of each sample are equal, right, or relatively equal, if we wanna use um, equal kind of loosely. But generally we say if P is less than 0.05, given that we're using a 95% level of confidence, right, basically we're saying in either of these statements at least one mean of however many groupings you have is significantly different from other means. Okay, um, basically how we do this is again very similar to t-tests where we say what are the actual mean differences between the means over what the expected mean differences would be in a population, right? That's our statistical inference or our standard error portion of our measurement, okay? So we could say these expected mean differences, um, or we could also phrase it as variance due to chance occurrence, which will make a little bit more sense when we actually look at how we calculate the F statistic or F ratio um, for both between and within subject uh, types of ANOVAs. But when we look at the differences between two means, we use a t-test. When we look at the difference between three or more means, we use an F ratio, okay? Um, so the way that we evaluate F is very similar to how we evaluate a T statistic or a T ratio um, in the sense that when we're estimating significance, right, we can use a table 
which um, we'll take a look at in the next slide. Um, but basically, again, this critical value that exists at a given level of confidence um, that conjoins up with your degrees of freedom for your samples will tell you how large your difference between your means has to be in order to be significant. So if the actual difference or your F statistic, right, that you get from your collected data, if that F statistic is greater than the value you need to be significant at this level of confidence, then we can assume that P is less than alpha, right, and that we know this relationship here in, indicates that we have a significant effect, in which case we would reject the null hypothesis because there's a really low chance that we've made a type one error. Okay, so this, this evaluation criteria is really nice because all you have to do uh, is change what ratio you're looking at. So for a t-test or a regression, you look at is t greater than the critical value Right in an ANOVA, you say is F greater than the critical value. So that's a kind of nice um, thing for you guys to think about uh, when when you're studying. Okay. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is that a significant F ratio. Oh, one second. I locked my husband out of my house and he just got home. So I will be right back. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm going to pause my recording and we resume recording. Okay, sorry. Um, so I wanted to point out a significant F ratio, again, tells us that at least one sample is not equal to the other ones. So you have at least one significant pair. But again, we don't know which pair is significantly different just based on ANOVA results. So we're introducing Another test, oh yeah, yeah, right? I know what you guys are thinking, not another one, right? But we have to use another test called post hoc tests to determine which um, pairs are significant between our groups, if there are any at all, okay? Um, and we'll, we'll go into that after I show you the uh, table for our F statistics. Whew. This is bad downside to the townhouses running up and downstairs. Okay, so uh, for you guys, at least for the previous tables that I've showed you before, um, usually we had various levels of confidence or various alpha values within a given table. For the F table, you will only be given one table that relates to an alpha of 0 0.05. So um, typically if you had, uh, or if you were using a table method to estimate p-values, there would be a different table for each of the main significance levels, right? Or a different table for each type of, or each level or value of alpha, or each, um, uh, of the main types of levels of confidence. So particularly a 90%, a 95%, and a 99%. Since pretty much all of our um, tests that we run in this class run off a 95% level of confidence because that's a default in SPSS, we're just using a table that's based on a 0.05 alpha, okay? So reading another table, what the heck, okay? The Best way to remember how to read this, both of these columns, this column and this first row, are representing degrees of freedom. Yes, there are new calculations for degrees of freedom, which really sucks because there's so many. But one thing to remember is, is you can see there's a very small number, right, or a small magnitude of the numbers on this top row. But as you go down this one, and this table is really, really long, um, but as you go down this way, the magnitude of the values get higher. So the easiest way to remember this is that the top row is looking at between subject comparisons such that you're looking at the degrees of freedom for the number of samples that you've collected. Okay, so let's say that you have 
five levels of one independent variable, your degrees of freedom for um, this top row, right? Five levels minus one would be four. So that's kind of how it works. So say how many, how many groups do you have? How many treatments are you applying? Generally tells you uh, what your degrees of freedom are for that top row. For the column, that's going to be your degrees of freedom of within subject comparisons. So this is when you consider everybody in all of the samples and how that comparison relates back to how you collected the people. So uh, generally, the between subject degrees of freedom is the same for both a simple one-way ANOVA as well as a repeated measures ANOVA. But the calculation of the within subject comparisons is slightly different. And we'll, I'll show that in a, a later slide for the calculation. Um, so it's organized a little bit better. But generally, that's how the table works, right? And so all of these numbers in the table represent critical values. So let's say that um, our degrees of freedom pair turned out to be 17 and 4, OK? Um, that would mean when we look at the actual mean differences between groups, our F ratio needs to be greater than 2.97 in order to be significant uh, with an alpha of 0.05. Okay. So kind of linking some concepts together. Um, one thing I do want to point out, because I think a bit of confusion might have come up in your guys' uh, previous activities when you had review questions or if you were looking at the significance of different values in a regression, is that tables, whether it's a Z table, whether it's um, a T table, or whether it's an F table, heck, whether it's a table for your R coefficients, which we didn't really go into, right? Anytime you have a table, it's going to estimate the p-value, okay? So when we look at these estimated values, it's all based off of the alpha level that is given on that table. So if you're like, I met the criteria for this critical value, my calculated statistic is greater than that critical value, meaning I have a significant difference, but it, you can only evaluate that significant difference at that given alpha level. So if you found a significant difference at 0 0.01, you can only say that your p-value is estimated to be greater than or less than 0 0.01, right? Same thing with 0 0.05 or 0 0.10. Okay, so table values are estimated p-values. In SPSS, you get exact p-values. So that's when you can say p is equal to 0 0.037. That was completely random. But generally, when you see the sig column or the significance column in your outputs, that is an exact p-value. Okay, and then you figure out if you're accepting or rejecting the null based off of your alpha level. So let's say our alpha level was 0 0.05, and what did I say? We get an exact p-value of 0 0.037, right? At that point, you're just saying, is that exact p-value uh, less than the alpha level that I set? And if it is, you have a significant difference, okay? All right, any questions so far? We're doing okay, okay. That's good. All right, so if you have a significant difference, remember um, that tells us there's a one significant pair present, but we don't know where it is. So I said you have to do post hoc tests to figure out where that significant difference is, okay? Um, and, and these post hoc tests are basically pairwise comparisons, which are t-tests, right? Because basically you're saying, I have, it's, let's say we have three groupings. That means you have three means, right? And you wanna see which means are significantly different from each other. So we do this by pairing two means at a time, and then like that, right? We compare two means at a time, and when we compare two means, that is essentially a t-test, right? Because t-tests looked at 
differences between two different groups. So we have special names for them because they're run after analysis, or that's basically what post hoc means. Okay, so after our main analysis, we can either run a two keys post hoc test, which we're gonna use in this class for independent samples. There's a lot of other different types of post hoc tests, but this class does not need to go into all of that. Okay, so whenever you have an independent sample or a simple one way ANOVA, use two keys post hoc test. If we're looking at repeated measures, we'll use Bonferroni, a Bonferroni method or correction factor for pairwise comparisons. Okay. And in the outputs, they'll actually show up as two keys post hoc tests um, or just pairwise comparisons. So when you're looking in your outputs, generally, pairwise comparisons or post hoc is something that you want to look for. Okay. So now we go into the more nitty gritty of each different test, okay? Which shouldn't be, like I said, too complex. So again, we're gonna use a one way or a simple ANOVA, right? To investigate um, instances where we have independent samples or between subjects design. Our assumptions when we have independent samples are very similar to an independent t-test. In the case where we always need a normally distributed population, we always need to have random sampling. Generally, we have an assumption based on the types of characteristics of data that we have, right? So parametric dependent variable, three levels of, a, of one non-parametric independent variable. And then we have homogeneity of variance, right? So this was an assumption that we had to meet in an independent t-test where we were saying that the variance between groups is relatively equal, right? And we'll go into this in the next slide, but homogeneity of variance still for independent samples, okay? And then lastly, again, we're kind of just re-emphasizing you have a between subject design, um, or that all groups are independent of one another. If you know three of these, know normal distribution, random sampling, homogeneity of variance. Number three and number five in, the, in my assumption list are kind of intuitive because you wouldn't have picked this test if these two things weren't true. But good to list them in either case. But on a test, if you forgot two, uh, data characteristics and sample characteristics are okay to leave out, but try to remember all of them if you can. Okay, so similar to last week, right? Our null hypo our, our assumption has a null hypothesis. Okay, so um, for homogeneity of variance, again, we're saying there are equal variances between samples. All right, so let's say we have sample A, B, and C. When we calculate the, the measures of variability, right, we would expect those to be relatively equal, meaning that the spread of data that exists in three different samples distributions, right, are going to be relatively equal. Um, similar again to last week, when we evaluated homogeneity of variance, we want to make sure um, that our p-value is greater than 0.05, because that means we've met our assumption. If we have not met our assumption and p is less than 0.05, that means we need a correction factor, okay? In a one-way simple ANOVA, we're gonna use a Welch's um, correction factor, which has some fancy name like a robust test for quality of means or something weird like that. Um, I just always refer to it as Welch's test, so. Um, whenever you see a Levine's test for homogeneity of variance p-value that is less than 0.05, that means we violated our assumption. We cannot assume equal variances between groups and a correction factor, usually to the degrees of freedom, has to be applied in order to make our samples comparable to each other. Okay. And then SPSS goes into calculating our F ratio. So that's kind of our next bit that we're gonna be talking about. So the F ratio in an independent sample situation 
is basically looking at what is the difference between the means between subjects, right? Or looking at differences between different groups versus the difference between the means within subjects. In other words, you're kind of collectively looking at everybody you've um, collected in all of your samples, okay? For a repeated measures, generally the setup is the same, except we're kind of looking at how, what are the differences between groups divided by what is the error, right? So in other statistics like z-scores or t-ratios, uh, t we've always looked at what is the standard error on the bottom. That's basically what this bottom portion indicates, okay? So what does ms stand for? It is the mean square. Okay, which is the average sum of squares. If you remember, sum of squares was included in our variance equation way back. Uh, it was a while ago right, when we talked about measures of variability, but sum of squares is included in variance, which is why we call this an analysis of variance, because it all ties back into the equation that the program processes for us. But basically, we find this average sum of squares by looking at the sum of squares um, between subjects and within subjects, and then we divide it by the respective degrees of freedom that go with that comparison. Okay, remember sum of squares is basically just looking at the deviation from the mean, because it's again part of variance, which is a measure of variability which looks at how much a group varies from a mean of a sample, right? So between subjects, we're looking generally at how far a group's mean deviates from the grand mean, which is the mean of every single subject, regardless of what grouping they're in, okay? Um, for the within subject sum of squares, we're looking at the deviation of a given score and how far it deviates from the group it belongs to. So if we were looking at um, uh, like someone's performance with um, a bang energy drink, right? We'd say this was the group mean for 1RM squats. Um, and then how far does that individual's 1RM squat performance deviate from the entire group? Okay, so that would be a within subject um, type of sum of squares. Okay, the last component of this is our degrees of freedom. And I kind of touched on this when we looked in the uh, table description, right? But degrees of freedom between subjects is gonna be in that top row where we're analyzing like how many groups or how many treatments did we give or how many samples do we have? And then we subtract from one. Okay, that's your between subject degrees of freedom. Your within subject degrees of freedom is going to look at how many people did you collect in all of the groups, and then you subtract how many groups you actually had. So if we had a sample of 50 people and we had five groups, the within subject degrees of freedom for that example would be 45, because we take 50 minus the five groupings, we get 45, okay? All right, so I realize that looking at this is a little bit intimidating, the only things you need to really know from this um, are how to calculate the F ratio. Generally, knowing that the mean of square for either between or within um, comparisons are going to be the sum of squares divided by the degrees of freedom. And then you need to know how to calculate degrees of freedom. And I've organized this information into a table so that way it's a little bit easier for you to visualize. And there's a practice table for you guys to use in the flowcharts as well that mimics this table, okay? So when you look at an ANOVA um, output, this is the ANOVA table that you're going to get for a independent samples or a simple one-way ANOVA. Like it looks, it's organized pretty much exactly like this in SPSS where it'll tell you what the between group comparison is. So usually this will be identified um, by the independent variable label. So if we were using my example of energy drinks um, and how that affects 1RM squat performance, 
this would say like between groups or this is my intervention, my energy drinks, okay? You get a sum of squares value, which you guys don't need to know how to calculate either one of these. So in any case, if I give you a table that has empty spaces in it, wink, wink, meaning it'll be on the test. Um, if I give you any blank squares, it will not be in the sum of square boxes. So you don't need to know how to calculate these. Okay, but you get a sum of squares for your between group and you get a sum of squares for your within group. Degrees of freedom, usually you will be able to calculate this based on the information that I give you in the research scenario. So if I said we collected 60 people for my bang uh, C4 and rain experiment, um, that tells you 60 people is n or the total number of people that I've collected, right? And that I have three different levels um, or interventions, right? Which would represent uh, one for each energy drink. So number of groups or k um, would represent uh, three, right? Or represent how many groups or samples that I have. So based on the research question, usually you'll be able to figure out what the degrees of freedom are. Um, for either between or within group comparisons. And then basically for the mean square, you just divide these two things or these two boxes from each other, okay, to get the mean square for between, the mean square for within. And then to get the F ratio, you divide mean square of between over mean square of within, okay. And then basically what happens with this F ratio, we look at a table if we're estimating, right, if if we're estimating in the case where I like give you a blank table, you would take that F, F ratio, look at your between and within degrees of freedom on the table, figure out what the critical value is, right, where those two de degrees of freedom intersect. And then if your F ratio is greater than that critical value, you have significance, right? And we say that's an estimated significance of P less than 0.05. If your F ratio was less than your critical value, then we would say we have an estimated P value that would exist um, greater than 0.05, okay? In the actual ANOVA table, after the F ratio, it will actually give you a P value uh, when you're looking in SPSS. So SPSS, again, gives you exact P values, so you would just report what that exact P value is, okay? To make this a little less messy, to kind of formulate how you would calculate things, I made an additional table, which is on our next slide, basically where we would say, this is A, B, C, and D, okay? To get the mean square, you divide A and C um, for the between groups row, right? Within groups row, you do B my, or B divided, or D divided by B, Right, and then the F is just kind of putting these two on top of each other. Okay, um, so that's in a nutshell, that's pretty much it, right? If we have a significant difference, we would have to look at post hoc tests, which we kind of already went over how to evaluate, right? Just looking at basically results of t tests to see if we have significant pairs. So, so far, are there any questions on kind of this? basic concept of ANOVAs. Okay, I'm going to take your silence as a no for now. Wait, I have a question. Yes, go for it. So I'm confused on the aspect that I, I thought uh, the one-way ANOVAs was just uh, between groups. What's up with the within groups category? Mm, so that goes back to this concept because in this case, and that's one thing that I kind of fault the description of ANOVAs on is because if we're looking at a between subject design, that'll be looking at differences between samples, in which case each sample has a different uh, set of individuals. But in an ANOVA, when we're looking at between group comparisons, that's just saying we're looking at how far a group's mean deviates from the mean of everybody we've collected. So in that case, you would be looking at between group differences um, as like how does sample A compare to sample B compare to sample C, 
which is different than saying we have individual people in each of those samples. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, it clears it up a bit. Yeah. And then like the within group would just say how far do we have deviations from the mean within a single group. Um, and then when we put those sums of squares together, that's how we get our F ratio or the actual difference that has been observed. Okay, so that's a, that's a very good question because we'll get kind of a repeat of that in our repeated measures ANOVA. But before I continue, any other questions? Cool. So the end of this should kind of wrap up relatively quickly. Because for repeated measures ANOVA, generally we have all of the same assumptions, with the exception that instead of homogeneity of variance, we're looking at sphericity. And instead of a between subject, design, we have a within subject design where we're using the same people over and over and over again. Um, to kind of comment on sphericity, we evaluate this using Mochley's test. Um, so when you think homogeneity of variance, you think Levine's test, sphericity, Mochley's test. Essentially, they're kind of looking at very similar things. Um, to say the variance between groups is equal or not equal. But sphericity has to do this comparison a slightly different way because we're reusing the same people. So instead of looking at the absolute variance between each group, we look at the differences between variances of each group. So we call this, um, basically, sphericity is looking for equal variance of the difference scores. And these different scores represent the differences between variances of paired samples. And I show that on this slide, right? So we would say the variance of group A minus the variance of group B is relatively equal to the difference between the variance of group B and the variance of group C, which is relatively equal to the difference between the variance of group A and the variance of group C. So you can see. In, with the, the calculation of sphericity or, or null hypothesis, we're saying the difference between variances of each possible pair of our levels of our independent variable should be relatively equal, such that we can assume the sample doesn't vary too much so that we can still say the same people were used um, for uh, each measurement that we put them through. Okay. Similarly to homogeneity of variance, we want to make sure we have a p-value greater than 0.05 because that means we've met our assumption that all of our variances between our different scores are equal, right? If we get a p-value less than 0.05, we have to use a correction factor, again, to fix our sample. For homogeneity of variance, that was Welch's test. For sphericity, it's the greenhouse geyser adjustment or the hewn felt adjustment. And I talk about these a little bit more in the flowchart video, which isn't too long, but there are certain criteria um, on when you would accept each of these. Okay. Um, and I kind of go into that in this slide, but specifically how you read it in the table will be in um, a sample video that I posted. Okay, so let's say that we have violated sphericity. We have failed Mochley's test. We got a p-value of less than 0.05. So we have not met our assumption, okay? We had make our adjustment based on a value uh, that we label as epsilon, okay? And it looks like a, a Greek letter epsilon with a hat, a pointy hat. It's going to a party, okay? Um, but basically we say, if epsilon is uh, less than or equal to 0.75, we don't have a severe enough difference between our variances. So we can use this um, more conservative adjustment, okay? If we have an epsilon that is greater than 0.75, we need to use um, a bit heavier adjustment, which is going to be the hue and felt adjustment. 
Okay. In this class, I don't feel like I ever have you guys use the hewn felt, but it's just knowing that 0.75 is kind of your evaluation number um, for these two, if you violate sphericity. Okay. So in a good day, let's say we've met all of our assumptions or we've made the appropriate adjustments to meet our assumptions, we can then calculate our F ratio, okay? So again, analysis of variance looks at variances between groups and how they compare up to each other. So with the within subject um, analysis, we have to consider a couple of extra variables, right? We still are looking at a between subject effect, which is, um, or a between group effect, looking at how different groups are varying from each other. We also need to look at a within group or within subject variability. So we understand how individuals are varying um, from the total mean um, of everybody, right? And then we also have to account for any error that'll occur from using the same person multiple times. So that leads us into our sum of square values, okay? Um, and the sum of squares calculation for the treatment, the subjects, as well as the error is going to be slightly different. Um, again, you don't need to know how to calculate these, but it's nice to be able to relate it back to how we calculated sum of squares for um, our uh, one way or simple one way ANOVA, right? Because generally when we're looking at how um, variances differ between groups. We look at how the, the group mean varies from the uh, grand mean or everybody put together, right? And then as far as looking at variance in um, subjects or within subjects or within groups, we see how a particular subject would vary with compared to the sample it was collected from, which in this case, we say it's the grand mean because we use the same people over and over and over again, okay? But re remember, these values will be given to you specifically the sum of squares for the error and the sum of squares for the treatment, those will be given to you in the ANOVA table. So treatment is kind of synonymous, or sum of squares for treatment is kind of synonymous with the sum of squares of the between group, comparison and the sum of squares for error is very similar or synonymous to our um, sum of squares for within group comparisons. If you're kind of trying to relay uh, similarities between um, an independent samples versus a repeated measures ANOVA. Okay. From here we have to calculate degrees of freedom. Okay, so between group we're looking at different treatments. We just say how many groups or samples have we collected or how many samples have we divided our single sample that's been collected, how many times did we divide their measurements, okay? And then for um, uh, error is the other one we kind of want to highlight. We look basically at the degrees of freedom for the treatment um, times the degrees of freedom for our number of subjects, which is our classic total number or total sample size minus one. Okay, so this is the, the one, remember in the um, F table, I said the within uh, group comparison degrees of freedom is gonna be different between an independent sample or simple one-way ANOVA and a repeated measures one-way ANOVA, okay? But generally, the idea of how we calculate the mean square is the same. It's sum of squares divided by degrees of freedom, okay? And then our F ratio is gonna be those two mean squares divided by each other, okay? So when we put all of this in a table, it's going to look quite similar to a between subject um, design or a between subject ANOVA, okay? where we have our between group comparisons listed first, and then we have the degree of error listed um, underneath. In the SPSS output, this treatment will show up as whatever the intervention was, 
right? So similar to uh, previously when I was like, I'm using energy drinks, energy drinks would literally word for word show up here if that was my independent variable um, classification, okay? Error is the wording that shows up on the table. So when you see error, you have to say, okay, that's my within group comparison. Okay. But again, how we order this information is the same. How we evaluate the F ratio is the same as we previously discussed. So it's all basically just making sure you understand if you have a repeated measures ANOVA versus a simple one-way ANOVA or independent samples ANOVA, and then understand what each of these um, basically means. But the evaluation process is exactly the same, okay? So similar to the last table where we had independent samples for repeated measures, it kind of organized the table. So it's kind of like a formulation of, all right, if I'm calculating this and I have blank values, you're always gonna be given the sum of squares, but through the scenario, you would figure out degrees of freedom calculations, and then using those degrees of freedom paired with the given sum of squares, you find the mean square, use those mean squares to find the F ratio, and then if you're in SPSS, you get an exact p-value on the table. If you're using an F table, you would estimate based on a critical value that um, is the intersection point between your degrees of freedom, okay? Um, and then last but not least, right, in either case, again, between repeated measures or a simple one-way ANOVA, F, the F statistic, again, is telling us what basically the size of the difference is between our samples. And if we have a significant effect of our independent variable on our dependent variable, we know there's at least one significant pair between our different groupings, right? So again, we would have to run post hoc tests to see which pairs are significant, right? And again, simple one-way ANOVAs will use two keys tests uh, one way repeated measures will use a bond for any adjustment. And if you're like my good friend Poe here, by this point in the lecture, it is okay, right? But I kind of added this little portion in um, because in post hoc tests or pairwise comparisons, you'll get p values for each pair. So that can add up to quite a bit depending on how many samples you have. But if we had three samples, basically it's looking at little t-tests, right? So you're saying two means are gonna be equal or two groups means are going to be equal. But you look at every single possible pair between each of the groups that you've collected. Okay, so the more groups you have, the more pairings you have to analyze. All right, are there any questions? Okay, if you guys come up with anything, please let me know. Um, usually I feel like the transition from t-test to ANOVA is pretty simple for students to grasp onto. Um, the activity is posted that has a little bit of review built into it. Also for the quiz, there are some uh, integrated questions that kind of tie t-tests and regressions and um, correlations back together. So uh, the quiz itself isn't as specific to, or at least a, a few of the questions aren't super, super specific just to ANOVAs. Um, so it, it kind of builds in a bit of review for you or makes you review information in order to answer those questions. Also make sure you review the flow chart um, and sample question, because uh, I put some sample lecture data. Um, I go over how to analyze that in the review video. Make sure you watch that before you do your first attempt because there are ANOVA tables that require um, the ability to understand how to read them before you actually take the quiz. So good luck on that. But with that being said, I'm gonna Go ahead and stop recording.